before we get to the main event. Um, next week, Sunday with Friends, will welcome Hal Crowther. Um, in your seat, you probably will have, you probably may have sat on it or found <laughs> this little <laughs> card that says Highlands Writers Book Fair. It is Saturday, April 13th. It's open 
uh, free and public to the library. I won't read it to you. You can read it yourselves. Um, today's <coughs> procedure after Francis's talk is there are refreshments in the children's area. There are book sales by the circulation desk. And there will be book signing in near the magazine area in the front of the library towards Valley Street. In the library, not outside. <laughs> um, we have the following books by Francis available today for sale from the library, and we have good prices. Um, See You in the Piazza, The Tuscan Sun Cookbook, Under Magnolia, Women in Sunlight, and Under the Tuscan Sun, which is an anniversary edition, so it is a new edition. One reviewer called See You in the Piazza a charming homage to upscale travel throughout Italy. For me, reading the books of Frances Mays is like being on vacation. She takes me on her travels. I don't want to do anything else but read. Can I order one of those enticing meals she describes so I don't have to return to my real life? <laughs> we are beyond thrilled to welcome the acclaimed author of seven books on Tuscany and Italy and travel around the world to this Friends of the Library event, Sunday with Friends. Thank you, Frances Mays, for coming to Abingdon to spend time with us this afternoon. And thank you also to Ed Mays, who was her driver. <laughs> all for coming on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. We just drove down. We got to see a little bit of spring all the way. Spring in Virginia is very nostalgic for me because I grew up in Fitzgerald, Georgia, and when I was deciding where to go to college, my grandfather told me that I could go anywhere I wanted to as long as it was not north of the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, about as north as I could get, I came to Virginia, and I went to Randolph-Macon Woman's College, and I always remember, just with these deep pains, how beautiful the spring was there. I think the most beautiful springs anywhere are in Virginia. And um, I want to thank the library for having me, and Ben Jennings, who's been such a friend, and has invited me to Abington several times. It's always a pleasure to come here and stay at the Martha and uh, get a little glimpse of this beautiful town. I have a bit of a voice thing because um, I've, I'm on a book tour and um, at one of my events a few days ago it was a dinner and a woman sitting next to me was just coughing all over me. And she said, I have bronchitis, but I'm not contagious. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I'm thrilled to see that uh, my neighbor, Hal Crowther, will be here. We both live in Hillsborough. I mean, probably a lot of them know him. He's married to Lee Smith, who's so interested in this area and I think was responsible for me coming down here in the first place. But Hal has a new book of really really feisty essays. He has a great sense of humor. <coughs> Uh-oh. <coughs> I'm so sorry. This is a note. I don't know that I can speak with the cough drop. That one has bourbon in it. So, so embarrassing. Maybe I'll stop to it. <laughs> Anyway, this book tour is for <coughs> Seaman Piazza. 
it's a travel book and I think I better go to the hospital. <laughs> traveling for um, See You in the Piazza. It's new places to discover in Italy. And the genesis of the book came from traveling way down south in Puglia, in the uh, heel of the boot of Italy. And we were having such a good time in the little tiny small towns in Puglia um, that I got the idea when I was there that it would be fun to write a book about small towns all over Italy. We were in uh, Troia, this tiny town. I think you saw, if you could see it, the big rose window in the cathedral there. It's Romanesque Puglian. And then we were in um, the bread town of Altamura, where the loaves of bread are about this big. <laughs> they weigh at least 10 pounds. <laughs> and we were in another little town, Orsara, where the bread oven was from the 1500s, and that we got to study the bread of Puglia, which is the best bread in Italy. So we were jumping out of the car, going to these little seaside coves to swim, and just having such a great time off-road in Italy, so to speak. So we kind of felt like it was restoring a sense of spontaneity to travel. And I got the bright idea while we were doing this vacation that, um, that we needed to do that a lot more. And it's particularly apt for us at that time because it was also when we were kind of discovering how extensively mass tourism is affecting Italy. About uh, five years ago, the Russians started traveling. Now the Russians are all over Italy. They're buying property everywhere. The Chinese are traveling. So you've got these two huge groups traveling in Italy that never used to travel there. And now the young Chinese are traveling. Imagine when it really gets going in China, what the world is going to be like for travel. So I would say um, there is a, just a huge effect of tourism 
partly from uh, the East Europeans. They used to not travel either. And now so many um, South Americans are traveling. So it just seemed kind of a wonderful thing to me to realize that there's still so much to see and so much to discover in these out of the way places. So we went from the very top, <coughs> north, um, to way down Sicily, Sardinia, and just stayed in these tiny places as much as possible. We also traveled to some cities that are, are known, like Catania and Parma and Geneva and Torino, but they are not very much visited. So I think, you know, finding some of these uh, cities down on the second tier of travel was part of the discovery too. If you've never been to Italy, you have to go to Rome and Venice and Florence and all those. You have to, but my case is save some time for some of the little places in between if you can. Um, what I learned at the end of these travels, and we were on the road for about a year and a half, was that Italy is the most diverse country in the world. I already knew that, but I didn't know it as well as I did by the time we got through traveling. And I was thinking along the way, why is it so diverse? Well, this is not a very big country. Why is it so different from top to bottom? And of course, you know, you look to history for every answer. And Italy was only united as a country in 1861. That's not that long ago. It's much newer as a whole country than the United States. And before that, it was chopped up into the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, the Bourbon Kings, the Papal States, these big feudal farms where the peasants never got to go anywhere. Plus, the Apennines come right straight down the middle of Italy, so they're um, the division into these little pockets of uh, little private worlds developed where different languages, different pasta, different art, different everything. So they, the, um, the result is private worlds everywhere. And the truth is that after 1861, when Garibaldi <coughs> united the country, it never really united. It's still an anarchic company, country, and um, I think the result, though, is that it is the most diverse country of any in the world. Cough, drop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a, a bit of the preface, if I can. Italy, the endless surprise. The places I've chosen for this book are, for example, because if you travel adventurously, you will find many others that draw you close and let you see why you ventured so far and what you will take with you when you leave. Will it be a swim in the October cold sea at Carlo Forte on Isola di San Pietro in Sardinia? A dip that jolted you out of summer doldrums and propelled you with great energy into the fall? Or a plate of arugula dressed with lemon juice and fresh olive oil in Sorrento, when the taste wedded to the heady scents of citrus blossoms from trees layered in ascending terraces all around you. That became the way you wanted to eat for the rest of your life. The regal cardinals driving into the Vatican, so pompous you're thinking, but then you catch a glimpse of his robe caught in his rear end, <laughs> proving that the divine is human. The mad woman performing Aida Arias in the fountain of Rome's Campo di Fiori, lantern shadows flickering on stone when you looked out over the deserted Piazza Navona at three in the morning, hearing only the splash of the outlandish fountains below. And then a man starts playing Vivaldi on his flute. You're wrong, all in a day. The private moments, the little bursts of secret meaning that travel can give, the ancient light through the Greek columns at Selenunte, grazing the face of your child, casting her 
into the long historical span of time. Places give us such gifts if we are ready to receive them. My home in Tuscany, Brahmasole, became second nature to me and now is the place I've lived the longest of anywhere in my life. Do I know Italy well? No, not because I haven't traveled, cooked, observed, gazed at a million paintings and read the convoluted history. To know Italy takes 10 lifetimes. Each time I return, I feel the same excitement I knew in the first years of living here. So much to learn, and what luck. I'll have five weeks or six days or three months. Surely I will begin to feel I have a grasp on the place. But Italy remains elusive. Just beyond that hilltop castle, there's a valley of olive trees. Then another town where the stony streets are pale gold instead of gray. Pasta's different there, made with half breadcrumbs. The dialect is unintelligible. The local Duomo's frescoes are painted in pale apricots and chalky blues. With sublime faces, you later see in the local bar while you sip your Negroni. You were in Bavania. Now you're a few kilometers away in Monte Falco, a new world. Infinite differences all packed into a country about the size of Arizona. That always gives me pause thinking that Italy and Arizona are the same. Imagine Arizona with uh, Rome and Florence and CNN and CC and 5,600 museums and 1,000 archaeological sites. It's amazing. <coughs> Hungering for more, more understanding, more exposure, more pasta, my husband Ed and I suddenly pack our little white Alfa Romeo and hit the road. Sometimes we're joined by William, our grandson. Sometimes we're joined by friends for an hour or for a week. Our wanderlust awakened. For a year and a half, we seek unique places hidden in plain sight. And also such cities, as I mentioned before, Genoa and Parma and Catania, the names known, but who has lingered there? Italy, infinite. Because pasta is the national anthem, I'm searching for quintessential taste of each place. Though instead of pasta, I might fall for sabrisolona, that crumbly, nutty dessert that turns divine when dipped in zabaglione. That swim in Carlo Forte, followed by robust pacari, a large, hollow pasta with a talent for soaking up eggplant and tomato sauce. Then a frito misto, fish pulled just from the water, crisply fried and succulent. That lusty dinner became Carlo Forte, and impossible to forget, the pitcher of fruity red wine and a salad of wild greens picked from the earth this morning. The score of our adventures is the music of many corks popping. Such passion everywhere for food, even a two-year-old has an adventurous palate. More snails, he bangs with his spoon. More, we share the zeal. On arrival in every town, Ed begins plotting how many lunches, how many dinners can we enjoy in this exceptional place. And markets, each town retains the tradition of weekly go-to-market day. What's freshest? What's ready to plant? Who has the truffles? Who has the best porchetta? Are the little violet artichokes in yet? I try to be in a town on market day because there you pick up a recipe for Topinambur, Jerusalem artichokes, or you're offered a taste of the Anurka apple, an ancient variety that's picked green and ripened to whiny sweetness on straw mats. The grower will brag that Italy has 1,500 varieties of apples, while the French only have 15. <laughs> A suspect figure, but I admire his passion, molto italiano. Vendors sometimes still hawk their wares, their high croaking voices hearkening back to the Middle Ages, 
when in these same streets men sold their honey and chickpeas. The most vivid pleasures of Italy are the simple ones. You're installed at a table on a sun-drenched piazza. You have your notebook and the whole day. There's nothing you must do except let that sundial cast its shadow on the next hour. Let the apricot facade of a Renaissance palazzo, palazzo reflect on the faces of those around you. Let the memories of what brought you here rise and facet in your mind. Let the waiter bring that second cappuccino before you set forth into the day. Fresh memories, Greek white villages of Puglia clinging to cliffs above the sea, the siren call of the Lazio coast, knotty medieval streets of Geneva, vast underground cisterns in Fermo, green hikes and hot chocolate in the Dolomiti, the trail of Frederick II's Puglian Romanesque churches, afternoons on the golden Tuscan beaches, the atmospheric Torino coffee bars where Cesare Pavese would write, endless, yes. That last reference to Cesare Pavese is um, because he is such a great favorite writer of mine. And he was from Torino. He lived there during the rise of fascism into World War II, that whole uh, complex era in Italy. And when I decided I wanted to write about Torino, it was largely because of his, um, his the whole literary world he lived in there. So I started looking online for a place to stay and I came across this listing for a and b called La Luna e il Falo, The Moon and the Bonfires. And I thought, somebody likes Pavese, that's the name of one of his novels. So I checked into it and it was his home, his absolute home. So for me, Torino became about staying in the home of Cesare Pavese and seeing the city through uh, his work and my imagination of him in all the places I was going to. Uh, his books were in the hall, his own library. We stayed in his bedroom and looked out at the beautiful balconies across the street and I thought, he sat here writing. This was, it was just very special. And that was kind of the way I liked to travel all through this book, and that was to find something very particular about that place that really kind of totally symbolized that place for me. I think it came from growing up in the South and reading all my life the Southern writers, the great Southern writers, Eudora Welty and Thomas Wolfe and Faulkner and James A.G., all of them. <coughs> you know, that the sense of place not only evoking a place and what it's like in the writing, but really recognizing that who you are is where you are, and that the influences of a place begin to shape you. you. You feel the force of the landscape. And I have always uh, taken that to heart in my own writing, and it comes directly from uh, from all the Southern writers, but also just from kind of a primitive sense of growing up in the Deep South and feeling that shaping force of the landscape. You know, those black swamps with the, uh, you think it's a little log floating and it opens its mouth and <laughs> sinkholes that drop through and houses collapse and hurricanes come through. It's a mighty landscape, the South, particularly way south where I came from, the swampy Pine Barren South, where you see that tornado out on the horizon. And all those things were very dramatic in terms of uh, feeling that shaping power of landscape. But you certainly feel it in the Dolomites, those craggy gray mountains way north where the light reflects pink and purple <coughs> and lavender all on these mountains and they're so formidable. Uh, you can imagine what it's like to grow up in their shadow. Way south in Sicily, my goodness, that Arab influence, uh, the Greek influence in Puglia, 
all these shaping things that contribute to a landscape were kind of on my mind as I was writing. I absolutely love Torino. It's one of the underappreciated large cities in Europe. It's one of the best places to eat in all the world. The restaurants are just grand. And it seems like everything was invented in Torino. The Grissini, Vermouth, Punta Mes, the Bicheron, the little coffee, it was one of the slides. It's a city of arcades with historic cafes and they all serve this little drink which is chocolate on the bottom and then very strong coffee and cream, whipped cream on the top. So you sip it and you get all these three layers. And there's something really nice about a city that invented a coffee drink 350 years ago and they're still enjoying it every day. Turin, I was just in Washington yesterday at the National Geographic. They have a big exhibit of uh, the queens of Egypt. And almost everything in the exhibit came from Torino. It has, for some lucky reason, someone started collecting in the 1700s, and it has the second largest Egyptian museum in the world. It also has a great car museum, because of course the Alphas and the Fiats and all those cars come from up there. And even if you don't like cars or don't get so excited about cars, you do start to covet one of those little vintage cars. <laughs> it's a cinema museum. It's the greenest city in Italy, so it was a grand surprise. And we would walk around thinking, where is everybody? Where is everybody? And then we'd think, oh, they're in Florence. You know? <laughs> so um, when I was um, in college, I loved this book, uh, Moments of an Italian Summer. It was by um, James Wright. It's just a little book of prose poems encapsulating uh, certain moments that he experienced. And I thought as I was writing this about that book, and I tried to make a collection of moments that I, I hoped would um, resonate with the reader. And I'm going to read one of those uh, little sections. We are here over in the Marque, Le Marque, the borders, um, it's on the Adriatic, just um, over from Tuscany. They always say, the Marque is going to be the next Tuscany. Well, it's not, you know. It's, it's, it's um, hard to get to. It's um, full of mountainous roads. But that's its charm, too. It's not, it's uh, very unspoiled. And they're just many, many, many secret villages to discover. It was one of the papal states, one of those where people couldn't go anywhere. If you lived in a papal state, you couldn't leave unless you had a passport. And I was drawn to Recanati, the home of the poet Leoparde, because um, he, he wrote a good bit about that area. And he had terrible parents. His mother, thought that children should die before they got old enough to sin. <laughs> so, Leopardi really wanted to leave. <laughs> but he couldn't because he didn't have a passport. He finally got out of there when he was about 20. And his town is beautiful. One of his photos was his statue. So he's still looking benevolently down on the town, but he hated it. <laughs> but if you go there now, it's really beautiful. And all those little towns in the mountains there. I'm so sorry I had this cough drop, but. So we're in the Marque. It has gorgeous beaches, and we're in the mountain, in, not in the mountains, over on the border near Tuscany at a little town called Sant'Angelo in Vado. And most people who go on truffle hunts go in Piemonte, north of Torino, and particularly around the area of Alba. But it's very, very uh, crowded at that time because everybody wants to go on a truffle hunt. 
but not very many people know that in Limarque they have really great white truffles too, and it's not um, very populated. So we have come to the uh, first truffle experience, um, and the little town is just a awash with truffles and. People are setting up stands everywhere, and all the restaurants feature truffles on the menu. And a lot of the little churches and civic buildings that are closed usually are open during truffle season. And um, we went in one little church, a volunteer was showing people around, and I looked at the name of the church, and it was the Church of the Bastards. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's nice, having a church for the bastards. But it turned out they were, they were for the little girl orphans um, who were born without the benefits of wedlock. So they had their own church, and it was this beautiful little church, Baroque church that looked like it was half made out of whipped cream, that white stone, white marble, all gilded. And then down the street from that, there was a little entrance to an underground room, and I saw kind of candlelight in there. And I walked down, it was a cave room, completely covered with photographs of people in that town who had died. And it was all candlelit. And there was still some space for others. And I think if you knew there, if you lived there, you knew that sooner or later you would be up there and your neighbors going out to get their bread or coffee would stop in and remember you. It was a really beautiful little memorial room. I've never seen anything quite like it. But here we are in the restaurant for the first truffle experience. We didn't reserve, but we're late enough to secure a table at Trattoria Tadeo e Federico, where we succumb to the white truffle our server authoritatively tells us what to order. You will be happy, she assures us, and we believe her. Only two diners remain in the room. They surreptitiously feed their dog when the server exits. <laughs> they look over at us, hoping we don't mind. We don't. What's your dog's name, I ask? They're dressed in scruffy walking clothes, hoodies, and boots. A late middle-aged couple, both with straw-colored hair and ruddy cheeks. Pietro, the woman says. As his name is called, the dog stands and looks hopeful. He's carefully groomed with thick, curly, toffee-colored fur that invites petting. Oh, I say, a truffle dog. The Lagotto Romagnolo is my favorite kind of dog. Smart, adorable, so alert. Brown and white underbelly. Pietro looks at me with I speak Italian eyes. <laughs> the breed goes way back. Lake dogs of Romagna, working dogs, used for hunting and for water retrieval. Now famous as keen searchers of truffles. Is he finding truffles here? No, the man says, slipping Pietro a sliver of prosciutto. We're from Piacenza. He's trained for black truffles and shows no interest in the white only in digging up the ground. <laughs> Just the same trouble at home, the woman adds. They like to dig everywhere, especially daffodil and tulip bulbs. <laughs> she looks at him fondly. He's terrible. Tremendo is what she says, a word often applied to a rambunctious toddler. I wish she were not saying this in front of Ed, as I've been lobbying to get this kind of dog. <laughs> as the server brings my tagliatelle and Ed's passatelle, a supersized policeman comes in the door. Someone is parked illegally in the piazza. My husband, our boisterous server announces, isn't he lucky to have a wife like me? We agree and turn to admire bowls of steaming passatelle, redolent of sliced truffles, not truly a pasta, passatelle is a local favorite. The tender little cylinders, a form from breadcrumbs, lemon, eggs, parmigiano, and nutmeg. The batter is passed through a special press. 
and then the little dumplings are poached like gnocchi. I've tried making them twice only to have them fall apart. These don't. They're in a bit of fragrant broth with, yes, truffle slices crowning them. We vow to come back for the truffle with red potato gnocchi and pakari a la carbonara. Pakari, the big tubular pasta, is one of my favorites for ragu. The rolled and stuffed rabbit sounds fine too. Anything with the precious white truffle. Pietro's ears lift and he's wagging his tail. Maybe if they fed him a few tastes, he'd get the idea. For us, with one bite, the action in the room fades and the pure experience of this simple and ancient flavor takes over. Musty, earthy, mysterious. If there's ever any occasion for that overused word, umami, this broth with passatelli is it. We sometimes get summer black truffles in Tuscany and relish those days, though sometimes the texture resembles wood chips. These are both firm and tender. Order another portion, but the tasting platter arrives, and all I want to do is stay in this room and eat a fluffy omelet with truffles, polenta with truffles, prostini with fonduta di pecorino and truffles, <laughs> potato sformato, a blur of truffles, it's over too soon. I'm always almost expecting truffle dessert. Since we're headlong into indulgence, we order another true taste of fall, the tortino di castagna con scaglie al cioccolato caldo, chestnut tort with melted chocolate. Now that we've simmered down and coffee is ordered, I wonder about the painted restaurant signs we saw outside the door of two gentlemen, Tadeo e Federico, namesakes of this restaurant. A note on the menu explains that the two Zuccari brothers, born in Sant'Angelo, <coughs> were artists in the mid and late 1500s. Pause. <laughs> Over coffee, Ed reads to me, Tadeo had left for Rome by age 14, quickly establishing himself as a painter. He painted frescoes in the Villa Farnese. He died in his mid-30s and was buried in the Pantheon where his neighbor is Raphael. Federico was already working in the Vatican by age 18. He became famous too, later painting in Spain, the Netherlands, Belgium, Florence's Duomo, the Galleria Borghese, all over. He was a pupil of Correggio from Parma. His 20 drawings of brother Tadeo are at the Getty in Los Angeles. Both brothers from this tiny and remote town. How did they make their way to Rome as boys? What was in the water? I never stopped marveling at the level of culture that has thrived in Italy for centuries, even in back of beyond corners. The father was an artist, Ed says. He must have wanted more for them and pushed them out the door. 3.30 seems like a good time to finish lunch. We go in search of our car, which we parked somewhere. Then we recall, the magic phones will tell us where we parked. Soon we won't have to think at all, just eat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I did okay, didn't I? Yeah. in my book tour for three days, I think I'll be able to shake this by the end of three days, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to chat and hear any comments or questions or about any of my other books or whatever you want to talk about. Yes. Excuse me, I have a question, but before I ask it, I'd like to uh, just say I was born and bred north of the Mason-Dixon <laughs> I'm sure 
Any number of schools would have welcomed you there, <laughs> depending on your GPA. <laughs> it was easier to get in schools then than it is now. <laughs> well, I did want to ask you, uh, you spoke of these uh, hordes of people ready to, or a, in the process of traveling the world. Are they confined somewhat by the summer vacation syndrome that moves us as well? Pretty much, yes. Uh, traveling off season is a great idea if you can do it. I mean, some people can't. They have to go in August. But if you can avoid July, August, I think it's, you know, it's just more pleasant not to have to uh, elbow your way down the street in That's some of the places. Is it? <laughs> yes. Good. Well, my husband Ed, which is it? where are you, Ed? Oh, he's back there. When people ask him uh, what's the best time to travel to Italy, he always says January through December. Because <laughs> each season does have its pleasures, and I love being there in the winter. But if I could only go to Venice in August, I would go, and I would have a great time. Because um, once you leave in these really popular cities, once you leave, the major tourist sites, you can still really experience this, the place well, particularly in some place like Venice, which turns out to be one of the great walking cities of the world. And also exploring, as I do in this book, the Venetian Lagoon, not just staying around San Marco and the center, the Centro, um, but um, getting on a uh, Vaporato and going out into the little islands is really interesting. Particularly Torcello. It's, it was where Venice began in the 7th century. People fleeing some Byzantine war um, came to a little island, Al Altimo, and then they moved to Torcello. And their fresco uh, mosaics in the church there from the 7th century through the 13th century. So when you get out on that little flat island where only three or four people still live, you get the sense of how Venice started, how they had the nerve to start piling those uh, poles down in the sand and start building on these sandbars. They're just this far out of the water. And it's, it gives you really a big hit of how Venice came to be and what courage it took and how how bizarre they were to do this. Not a very good location for a city, is it? Not the best, but it is the most beautiful city in the world. I mean, sometimes people say to me, I don't really like Venice, it's so it's crowded. And I think, well, I don't like you. <laughs> It's always been the most, really, the most beautiful place. <laughs> yes. You've inspired us to get you to Italy twice, and your cookbook has really inspired me to change my cooking, like cooking from scratch to make pasta. And oh, great. And so it's fun. But I have a more of a process question. You always, a lot of your books, you talk about writing things down in your notebook. How do you keep things organized in your notebook? Like, how do you okay. go back and find them? She was asking about the uh, process of writing, but <laughs> prefacing it, saying her cooking had changed because of our cookbook. <laughs> uh, cooking in, in Italy is so much fun. Uh, my writing process has changed now that I've gotten addicted to certain devices. I used to just scrawl all over a notebook. I didn't really have any order. It was just day by day. I'd write the date and place, but it was all impressionistic, and that was the main way I wrote. Now, I am really happy to use that little voice recorder on my phone. I find it is less, I don't have to fumble around and get the pen and all that. And I say where I am and what day it is. And I, as I walk around, I just get it out and talk to myself. And I also take a lot of photographs now. So having that magic phone not only tells me where I parked, but um, <laughs> it's really kind of changed my writing. And then as we're traveling, I try to write every night, but oh, you know, it was great wine to drink and <laughs> restaurants, and sometimes I don't, but the process, it's really fun to write and travel because it kind of gives you the experience twice. 
a, a, a Chinese, ancient Chinese poet said, to make an image is to live twice. That is, you see it and then you recreate it in words. And I feel that way about writing about places as well, that you're there and you're seeing everything and experiencing, and then you get it again as you, you get the joy of trying to recreate it in words. Yes. I just wanted to thank you for including San Sepulcro. My grandmother was born in San Sepulcro, and her name oh. was Perugini. Perugini. So I was thrilled that she you She related to the that. painter. <laughs> Probably so. San Sepulcro is one of our favorite towns. <coughs> Just a second. San Sepulcro is in Tuscany. It was the home of Piero della Francesca. Mm -hmm. So some of the greatest paintings in the world are in that little town. And I love this story. A World War II bomber was instructed to bomb San Sepulcro, particularly the train station. And as he approached, he. this is the value of a liberal arts education. He remembered a class he had had in college where the professor had said that some of the greatest paintings in the world were in San Sepulcro. So he veered around and didn't, did not bomb the town. It's a flat town. It's, uh, it's, it's one, of the, one of the best little towns and also not crowded at all. Thank you. Yes. Could you speak about your book Under Magnolia a little bit and and what brought you to write it and, and how you felt after it was published? Okay, thank you. Um, Under Magnolia is my memoir about growing up in the South in Fitzgerald, Georgia. And it's about my crazy family and writing it <laughs> cost me my relationship with my sister. So if you start writing about your family, be careful. <laughs> I was careful, but and I started to begin letting go of being worried about what everyone was going to think of it when I realized that nothing I could write about growing up was going to please them. Nothing was, so I might as well write what I wanted to write. But I, that's one of my favorite books I've ever written because I got to um, really re-experience what I was talking about earlier, that, that power of growing up in a place and I also know from traveling so much and speaking all over the place that um, people tend to look down on little towns like that. And I know what, what a world it was, you know, what a passionate, intense, alive, interesting place it was. So I wanted in that way to kind of pay homage to um, sensibility in a small, really small town. Um, my mother uh, died about five years before it was published, so she never had the pleasure of raising hell over it. But <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was quite it was very emotional to write that book. I'm saying this this was really fun to write, and of course many emotions in places, but. Um, something that goes down into the primitive waters of your past is, is much more um, intense as a writing experience. Did you have a if, when you're wandering around Italy, let's say you and your husband, and you, you may have a list of restaurants that you've heard of, or do you very often just sort of wander around and look at something that catches your Fancy or how yes, do she's do asking, I don't know whether you can hear her, but um, she was asking about how do you choose a restaurant? You may have heard of some, but if you're just somewhere and you don't know, how do you, how do you really find the great place in town to eat? One thing we do is go in the nicest shop, like the wine store or the, you know, the really nice little fruit of Evadura, and we say, um, when you go out for your birthday or a celebration, where do you eat? We don't say what's a good restaurant because then we think they might say where tourists go. Yeah. But when you say where do you eat, it's, you usually get a good tip. I use the Gambero, Gambero Rosso um, guide. It's in Italian. 
but it's very symbol oriented so you can tell the ratings and it's a very reliable guide. During the year I tear out things from magazines. Um, if I think I'm going to be near some of those places and just keep kind of a, a little file on places I might someday go. I use a Michelin guide a little bit. Um, they're not as reliable in Italy as they are in France, but still they're not going to lead you too far astray. Also, follow your nose. You know, this looks cool. Let's look at that menu. If it's old and doesn't look like it's been changed in three years, you don't go, but... Do they have the menus in the window like they do in China? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The menus are usually on display. See if something good smells, something smells good coming out the door. You started to say something. I was about Willie Bell. Did you ever... I oh, you, I think I know Willie, Bell and... uh, Willie Bell, back to the uh, memoir under Magnolia. Willie Bell was our um, cook when I was growing up, and she disappeared into the north, and we never heard from her but a couple of times after that. And I, we've, uh, my sisters and I have looked for her in various ways, but we never found her. She, was, um, she gave me a point of view. She would say, don't pay any attention to them, they're all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had hoped that too. <laughs> yes. Do you still have tourists from around the world knocking on your door? We, do we have tourists from around the world knocking on our door? They, they still come, but they don't knock. <laughs> um, our house is kind of above the road. You probably saw a picture of it. Um, so people come because uh, Under the Tuscan Sun has been translated into 54 languages. So we do get people from Estonia and Brazil and all over. And if, if we're coming and going, we, we speak out often, have pictures taken in the driveway with lots of people. But it's, it's not a problem for us. It's, um, it's a pleasure to meet someone who would come to see a house because of a book, I think. And I know Peter Mayo left his house in France because somebody jumped in the swimming pool. From this book. I, um, I said to Ed, the people who read my books are nicer than the people who read his. <laughs> it's just been a pleasure. And two people met in the road and got married. Uh, and did you get upset because you were omitting from the movie? No, I was not omitting. I, I was the hero at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, movie I always thought Ed was a lot cuter than the man who showed up at the end. <laughs> but I, I really liked the movie. I enjoyed um, the whole process of it. And my novel, um, Women in Sunlight, has just been optioned for a movie, which is kind of exciting. And I was, I was in Los Angeles recently, and I saw Diane Lane, and I said, would you be in the new movie? And she said, yes. So, I mean, she was kidding, but I wish she would. I wish she would. Um, the process of making the movie was really fun. And... I was worried because Cortona is a small town. It's 2,500 people on a good day. And I thought, well, what's going to happen when this crew of 27 moving vans comes in and all these people are in town and they're scruffy and they're drinking and they're, you know, whatever. I thought, what's going to happen? I shouldn't have worried, though. I, I said to Ed, I guess the Italians have seen barbarian hordes before. <laughs> so they all just kind of took it in stride. <laughs> they, they put up a fountain in the middle of town for one of the scenes, and um, it was made of resin. And I was in town just as it was put up, and there was an English tour guide there with her group, and she was saying, and this is Cortona's Baroque fountain. <laughs> it's so funny. And the people in town were kind of upset about the fountain because it had a 
figure in the middle of Neptune. He's holding up a shell and the water's dripping off the shell. He was a very colossal figure, which means he was uh, colossal in all his parts. <laughs> and some of the older people in town took exception to that. They thought it was not dignified. And I was again in the piazza and I saw the people from Touchstone out there with a saw. Cutting <laughs> Neptune down to size. <laughs> But the, um, the, after the movie was gone, they took the fountain down, and then after that, everybody missed it. <laughs> and something really odd happened. Uh, a year or so later, somebody gave me a 17th century engraving of the piazza in Cortana, and there was a fountain there. Oh. But nobody knows what happened to it. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. When you were in all these different uh, places that you visited for the book, did you find that you had to speak Italian when you were there? Did you have a language problem? A little bit of Italian goes a long way. Ed is pretty fluent. My Italian's okay. Walking around Italian's okay. But Ed's really good, and he talks to people everywhere. But no, people go to Italy all the time not knowing much, and it's Even fine. In a smaller town? Yeah. yeah. A long time ago, when we first got there, hardly anyone spoke English and now everywhere there's a lot of English but it's kind of fun when there's not I actually like traveling in places where I don't know the language because I'm not responsible for anything <laughs> I can't help it <laughs> thank you thank you very much Can you tell us a little about it, or do you still have it? Uh, the sec we did, we were crazy. We bought a second house in Italy. Well, uh, we were out picking blackberries in the chestnut forest and up in the country, and we saw this little stone hut, this little house in the distance, and we kind of scrambled over to it through the brambles, and it turned out to be this charming little cottage. The roof was on the floor. But um, we learned that it was built by the followers of St. Francis of Assisi, the hermits who lived in the hills. And um, we bought it. We bought it. We did a historic restoration on it. We really loved it. We kept it for about 10 years. And then it finally came clear to even us that it was crazy having two houses in the same town. So your red shoes are always at the other house. And actually, it just the maintenance of two complex old houses kind of became too much. So we sold it to an English family with five children, and they love it. They've invited us, but I will never go see it. I just couldn't stand to see if they'd done something tacky. <laughs> Any last question or I will be done. Thank you so much for coming. Eat and drink and be merry, buy books, and Francis will be in the far end of the library signing books. <laughs>